Okay. So the thing, the thing about this is that um, adding layers of processing to, to fix something is, um, is, never, is never a good thing. Even, even if it's not um, being used, if it's in the chain, it's um, throwing the numbers around and um, every time you do an iteration of numbers, unless the mass is absolutely perfect and it never is, uh, and the clocks are perfect, um, it's going to affect it. So it's a much better idea to make that long walk to the stage and move the microphone rather than, um, than try and use EQ. So, um, I mean, uh, Paul Stavros's book, which we're really quite, quite fond of, he, he, one of his sayings is the maximum of illusion with the minimum of voltage. And that's about keeping the audio chain as straightforward and simple as possible because original audio is a very delicate and uh, fragile thing. And everything you do to it is going to bring it down. You, you can't reconstruct transient information. Once it's gone blunt or crunched up, you can never get that back to, to purity. So, um, uh, you know, try to, try to keep plugins and EQ and all the rest of it to an absolute minimum if you want, want to get good audio. Um, yeah. Anything to add? Guys? Well, if, yeah, just quickly, um, if you're using a, a mixing desk with VCAs and subgroups and you don't actually need them, bypass mm. them. Just bypass everything you can. If there's a graphic in the rack out front and you're not using it, stick it in bypass. You will hear it. You hit the bypass button on a on a on a graphic with no fade with all the faders at zero, you'll hear it. On the Midas here, if the EQ's flat and you're not using it, bypass it, you'll hear the difference. And the more windows you clean, the more you know, the better you see everything. Everything in the chain's effectively, you know, potentially a dirty window. Yeah. I I learned sorry. <coughs> Too old to twist around that far. <laughs> the Exorcist. <laughs> but no, when I, when I first started, I came to London, a, a little roadie full of myself, thought I knew it all. And I remember going down to BBC sessions, radio sessions. And these old boys, we, we're surrounded by massive amounts of technology. You can process this, you can process that, you can disappear up your own behind with processing. These old boys at the BBC had these grey boxes with these huge black knobs on. And essentially, it was volume, tone. That was it. Right, there was nothing to, else to do. So these guys had turned picking the right microphone and putting it in exactly the right place into a fine art. And if you go back and listen to some of those, I listened to some of those radio sessions from the 70s, and the sound is absolutely stunning. And they had no parametric equalizers, no compressors. No, it was literally volume and tone and pick the right microphone. But the reason it sounded so good is, as John said, <laughs> It wasn't played with, messed with at all. It was the minimum of, in, uh, uh, you know, of intrusion on the pure audio. And I still believe that applies today. And there's a terrible temptation, it, because we're surrounded by so many wonderful toys these days, you can do anything, you can fix this, you can fix that, to immediately look for a technological solution to a really practical problem. And the, the, you know, the only thing we come back to is, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Because if, there's a, you know, if something doesn't sound right, for instance, from a recording point of view, it's probably because the microphone's not the right one, or it's not in the right place. It's not for lack of processing. And, and the one thing that a lot of manufacturers get wrong, it's understandable when they have all this technology. I've seen manufacturers say to me, listen to this, this is, these are the graphs, this shows what it's doing. And you look at it, it's in a typical a microphone. They'll show me two microphones, and on the test sheets, they show the frequency response, and they're identical. And I pick them up, and I go, why do they sound completely different? And, they, and the boffins go, what? But the graph said it's straight. But why do they sound different? Because the ears, our ears, are so, when we were younger, are so much better measuring devices than anything <laughs> they've got in the laboratory or in R&D department. And so you, know, you have to trust your own ears before anything else. If you do that, then you'll be able to tell the difference. And don't, you know, don't rely on technology, as Tony has just demonstrated. This is like 21st century technology, but it actually doesn't sound as good as it used to sound before we digitized it. You know? So use your ears as the only judge, as the only measuring instrument that's worth a thing. The rest of it, regardless of the technology, your ears will tell you as you do there. Can you hear a difference? Does it make it better? If it doesn't, leave it out the signal chain. Okay? Mm. So that's just... And, 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 and just put a, uh, a little bit more weight on what Roger's saying about 
your ears being being incredible inst instruments. Um, I mean, I've I've mentioned this before, but uh, Dr. Peter Lennox at Derby University, um, they they ran a they ran a test where they put a, a blindfolded person and had a sound source and. We're trying to find out how much you have to move the sound source before it's detected. And um, on all sorts of people, this turns out to be uh, one or two degrees. So if, you, if we get vector location from the difference in arrival time between our two ears, that actually translates to about 15 or 20 microseconds, which is, millis which is millionths of a second. So. And in terms of resolution, if you, if you, if you um, liken that to the frame rate of video, which is 28, 30 frames per second, gives you a complete continuum, that makes it about 2,000 times more higher resolution. And we think it's why so much digital, um, you can't really put your finger on what's making you uncomfortable with it, but you are. And it's probably to do with, with, with micro-timing things because our ears are absolutely developed to do that. I mean, historically, part of our survival is, is how good our ears are. Um, when we're on the plains of Africa, uh, half the time it's going to be dark and maybe half the light time we're going to be in the jungle. So, so audio was a, a very highly developed sense because not only did you have to hear um, something that might be about to kill you or something that could be food, you had to know instantly in which direction it was because if you have to run, you need to know what direction you're running in. So our vector location is really good and that means our timing ability is fantastic. And uh, so I'm just giving my little theory as to why your ears are actually way better than any instrumentation. Most delays are measured in... Um, in milliseconds. Well, our ears are good for microseconds. They're a fantastic instrument.